Okay. So a bit of context, I've been working in AI and machine learning for about 40 years. Last 20, I've been fortunate to work with some world-class experts. Am I loud enough? Some of whom are in this room. A little bit louder, okay. <clears throat> uh, lots of different world-class experts on many medical tasks uh, that range from, from cancers to the transplantation, diabetes, psychiatry, and so forth. But what's interesting about these tasks is the people I work with, the medical experts, they often start by saying, you know, build a tool which does what I do, but does it better. Well, what does that mean? So to get context, let's go back. People know the Wayback Machine? Uh, let's go back a little bit, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, back when I was growing up. Uh, well, we had an idea of expert advice. There's a patient. Does this patient have depression, major depressive disorder? So a doctor would say, to ask this question, tell me a few factors, his handedness, his age, and his IQ, and so forth. And I get that information. And then the doctor takes this and thinks about it for a while. And you know, that's what doctors think, apparently. And comes up with the answer, yes, the patient does have MDD. So, <clears throat> so that was the model of how diagnosis took place. And then this expert advice in the 1980s, they said, but gee, doctors aren't everywhere. Can we somehow build a system that does so expert systems came into power. Expert systems, they would basically take the doctor's knowledge, this knowledge extraction, it sounds painful, but it wasn't, and get some, some rules, that would be what the doctor was, was doing. That's just the model what the doctor's doing. So, of course, this works great if the expert knows the answer correctly and can articulate that answer, because it's only as good as that expert is, of course, by the very nature of how we're trying to copy it. So that was the 80s. Now let's go forward again, uh, back maybe 20 years to the 2000s. And now, as you all know, this is a day when we talk about classifiers. So it's the same type of knowledge and produce the answer. But how do we get the classifier? Where does that come from? Well, we have historical patients, the same type of individuals, same characteristics. But now we have machine learning algorithms that produce a classifier that can then give answers. And again, I've got a whole talk about how to do this where people aren't familiar with it, but let me go on. So supervised machine learning takes knowledge base like this and try to produce answer and try to learn classifiers from that. So the characteristics like where the features being used, what's the distribution of instances we have to worry about. But also, there's questions of what is the outcome label? For example, a diagnostic test, the manic depressive disorder. Louder? <coughs> I'm okay. And the other question, what are the true labels? What should the label be for this? So I'm gonna talk about these two points. First, about what the labels should be. What does a true label look like? So one answer is, well, remember that do what I do. You know, the doctor, maybe we should model what the doctor is doing. So here's the situation. Who has depression? You know, training time. There's a bunch of patients characterized. And here's a doctor, the same guy. He says, yeah, yes, no, yes. That's, that's the answer, we're done. Well, actually, another clinician actually said, oh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, maybe this wasn't the right set of answers. One second here. <clears throat> um, and it turns out there's, they're not universal agreement. They make some differences. So I said we should copy a doctor. Well, which doctor should we copy? Uh, him or her? How do you decide? Uh, maybe the old. So it turns out it's something called a Kappa score. Who knows what Kappa scores are? The Kappa scores are the agreement. How much two different individuals agree on assessments about movies or about where to buy a house. Or in this case, who is depression? Kappa of one means they agree completely. They like the same movies, they hate the same movies. And Kappa zero means you might as well flip a coin. For the Kappa score is about 0.32. It's not flipping a coin, but it's not that much better. And that's true for many psychiatric uh, diagnoses. So we see numbers that are, you know, 0 0.06 and 0 0.61. These aren't these aren't these numbers are not one or close to one. Oh, what about things that aren't so arbitrary? What about pathology scores? That pathologists look at a histological slide and makes an assessment. That's got to be really accurate. It has to be consistent. Half the scores are 0 0.36, 0 0.46, 0 0.25. They're not the same. Different doctors give different answers. So now. Which doctor should you agree with? Should you use the most senior, the latter, the one who read, read the latest medical journal? It gets even worse. 
the example that you at and say, here's a case, tell me your assessment on Monday, and the doctor says, yes. And you give the, doc the same doctor the same case, same information on Wednesday, and guess what? It's a different answer. So this idea of just using a doctor is problematic. Which doctor, and even what doctor on what day? So, mm, so maybe do what I do is problematic. How do I make it better? Well, one approach is to have labels these outcomes we're trying to predict. Because truth doesn't depend on a person, which is objective, not subject. So let's have some objective criteria, which are unambiguous, where kappa looks like one or close to one. So, <clears throat> so how would you do this? So let's give a definition. I'll say a label is objective if an instance of label is objective, if and only if there's an unambiguous way to determine or to verify the true value. So for example, hyperglycemia. And that means the blood glucose is less than 3.9 millimoles per liter. And there's a measurement, assuming people can, can read the instrument, you have three doctors in the same, they all will look at the same instrument and all say yes or no, unambiguous. What about being overweight? Clinical definition is based on the EMI, and you look at the patient's height and weight, and it's unambiguous. By definition, this person has, has, uh, is overweight or not, based on these simple objective measurements that everyone agrees with. But what about this? If I ask people in this audience, does this person have a broken bone? Yes. <clears throat> so again, in many cases, even analog things can be unambiguous. Again, not always, but it does happen sometimes. So this idea of having an objective outcome is actually possible in some cases. <clears throat> so often there's some direct observations or some simple computation of those observations that gives you the answer. So if objective means observable, why are we doing it? Why, why do we need to learn a model that estimates a label? If it's just look up. Well, let me describe four situations where that's important. Um, objective labels now, objective labels in the future, and then objective labels in the future with an action, and objective labels best action. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for them. These were the important ones. Let's do the first one. So, objective label now, that's what the patient's current status is. So, perhaps there's an objective measure which is expensive or painful or risky, but maybe there's a predictive model that uses cheap, paid for your risk free model. So, for example, adenoma is a colonoscopy, or you have to get that involved, which is expensive, painful, and there's some risk. And even if it was perfect, there's another tool called PolyX. That's cheap, it's a, it's a urine test, uh, it's painless, and it's risk free. Are you quiet? Continue. <laughs> Closer, okay. The online audience. This thing. Talk louder. Okay, okay. okay. Um, if I start being quiet, tell Bob. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep talking and I'll try, I'll try to project my voice to wherever these people are. And, uh, and uh, anywhere in the world. I'm facing east. So. Okay. so another example would be fatty liver. I'll let you guess what that device is for. So they can do a biopsy, which is expensive, painful, and risky. Or there's an ultrasound test. Again, companies in Edmonton have been looking at ultrasound tools for, for trying to determine who has fatty liver. And even if the biopsy is perfect, it's still a less expensive, um, a better device, better way to do it in many cases. So that was now. What about the future? What if you want to learn a predictive model? Because I need to know now what a patient status will be later on. For example, what is this patient's weight in 30 days? Well, I can measure in 30 days, but today on, a, on, a, on February 8th, I don't know what it will be, but when it comes around to March 9th, I'll know the answer. Or maybe so it's A1C for person with diabetes, uh, we can try to compute the um, um, like glucose value, or maybe the best depressed inventory in eight weeks. These are things which are objective measures, but I don't know them now, but I want to make decisions. So this is the future. There's also when I include the, the action. So what if someone's weight in 30 days? It was on the paleo diet. What if someone's A1C if there's a specific diabetes regimen with correction factors and carbohydrate ratios? Or what if someone's 
um, DDI score, and we get they take an SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So that's a third type of objective measure. I can measure it objectively because of measurements, but I can't do it now. I have to wait that time. And the most interesting case, the one I'll focus most to talk on, is objective action, objective label for the best action. So I want to find the best outcomes. So for example, I want to find the best way in 30 days. And I get to consider paleo, Mediterranean, vegan, or no diet. What's the best A1C? And I consider various CRCF values, or the best BDI with different medications. So I want to find the best answer, and maybe the answer is, you know, vegan, this value, that value. So this is the fourth type of thing. I want to find the best action to, to administer, to take, best intervention. We're going to see it's not quite objective. I'm going to talk about ways around that later on. So to give a summary, the objective label now, I describe a patient, and I want to find the patient's weight at this moment. Objective label future, I describe the patient the same way, and I want to know the patient's weight in the future, 30 days from now. Objective label does that, and future with action, I can say patient, but now I'm saying, and he gets a vegan diet. And now, what's the way in 30 days? And finally, the objective weight, um, I'm sorry, the objective label, best action, describe the patient, and the answer will not be, you know, one of the numbers, it's going to be an action of vegan. So these are the four types of models. I'm going to focus on these two. So that was the background. I talked about an objective actual label. Second part talks about objective. Third part talks about actionable. And then I'll talk about some issues that come up. And again, it's been a lot of time. And at some point, Bobby Joe will say, stop. So see how far you get. Um, simple models and more complicated. So I've already talked about types of objective labels. I'm going to talk about this idea of objectivity and talk about one subtlety that was confusing at first call so I'm going to do it, is the formal definition of a learning path. So far as just what the label should be about learning. So we're talking objectivity. Are, are people tracking so far? <laughs> uh, objectivity, I gave this definition, is an unambiguous way to determine its true value, independent of the observed, as opposed to not objective, judges based on an interview or human interpretation. So I talked about this being objective by being able to devise or obvious, or obvious measurements to look at sometimes. But what about this case? Patient self-reports for that, that uh, depressive inventory. So why, why do I call this objective? It sounds pretty subjective, it's patient's answer. And let me address that point now. <laughs> let me contrast two similar statements for graphic difference. One is, does P equal MP? That's the answer. And let me contrast it with Russ says P. I'm Russ, by the way. So P equals NP. <laughs> did, did Russ say that? Look at statements. This one, after decades of research, if you don't know the answer, this one, you know it with just sort of microphone. What about the veracity of Fred is sad versus Fred said Fred is sad? Well, this could take a psychiatrist, take analysis, and this is, again, just a microphone. So I would say if you have a thousand you know, or five different psychiatrists look at the same patient and the patient says, I'm Fred and I'm sad. Did Fred say he was sad? So anyone who knows about the SOAP model, objective, objective assessment and plan, this is exactly backwards what they say. I'm talking about clinician objective. The patient might be subjective. That's not the issue. Do two clinicians agree that I'm talking about subjective? <laughs> of course, he might be lying. He might be, yeah, I agree. All those issues come up, but right now I'm saying this is clinician objection. <laughs> so, um, what are the true labels? Well, we could use diagnosis, but forget that. Let's talk about objective measures like the BDI score being bigger than 10. Again, that's a, that's a scale and assessment. Uh, Patients fill it out, people add up numbers, and you get a score which is zero to 30 or something. Bigger than 10 means yes. By definition, by some definitions, this could be depression. But let's just talk about that. That's an objective measure. It doesn't take a psychiatrist, it takes just someone who can add numbers, and we all can do that. So, formal definition, pretty quickly, 
I talked about just what the label should be. What is, I'm a machine learning guy. What is a learning task? Well, the learning task is a mod, is something that takes um, a description of a patient, a label, um, and I'm looking for a function that an approximation to that, which is somewhere in makeup trying to minimize the LT. That would be what this measure is. Um, I want to minimize that for the objective of the future. Same idea, everything's the same. This is now looking for a value in the future. Again, given F, I want to find F half and swim into it. No surprises there. For objectively of future with action, same idea. Um, and now there's patients and an action, which is playable. <laughs> and there's also a set of possible, possible actions to consider. Again, I'm trying to minimize the L1 loss or L2 loss. Same idea there. People tracking so far? <clears throat> now for the fun part. What about four models? I've given three of them. Now for the exciting part. What about actionable labels? This objective label with, uh, for best action. Let me talk about that. We first motivate. Great, we're done. We have a diagnostic tool, a tool which determines an objective way if someone has depression. We can use this to produce a label training set to learn a model that diagnoses novel patients. Done. Well, <coughs> maybe. Now what? Patient has depression. What do you do? Well, you get an SSRI, an SRI. I don't know, you get a ketamine. People heard about ketamine in the news these days, so it's another treatment. Or, or maybe there's therapies. Like your behavioral therapy, or just shock therapy, and so forth. All sorts of other therapies. Which one should you use? And it makes a difference. Different patients respond. It's only about 50% response to any single antidepressant. And it's often 33, you know, one third for other types of treatments. It's, uh, it's not obvious. Just saying someone is depressed doesn't say what you should do about it. <laughs> so I talked about finding um, the true values of the labels, but what should the, and it should be objective, but what should the label be? Why am I asking about MDD if that doesn't say what to do about it? Why does that matter? Let's switch it. Let's talk about treatment. Let's try to find the best treatment for the patient. Let's try to find the patients for whom SSRIs are the right treatment. So what treatment should we give? Well, there's our three patients again. And there's a clinician who says, I know I've been doing for years SSRIs and, and a cognitive behavioral therapy done. But guess what? Another clinician might say, oh, maybe not. But again, not agreement. Same situation we had earlier. The fact that they have a range of treatments, doctors are yeah, you know, they're trying hard, they're conscientious, they're hardworking, but they don't always agree with each other. So what should we use in the same set of questions? <laughs> so what we could do is say, imagine we include patient under treatment, and we knew the BDI score. Imagine we forecast that. Imagine we predict a model that told us the BDI score in eight weeks. We thought it was, well, we're still not done, but now, Imagine I will find the most effective treatment. And imagine I consider, look at the animation. What if you had, <laughs> if you had I don't know. What if you had And imagine we could solve selection bias and counter factors. Imagine we could do that. We can now say, what is the score for this patient with CPT? It's 14, by the way. And so we can do counterfactual outcomes. And now, what's the best treatment? What's the label? Oh, I want to use the one which has the lowest score, SSRIs and CBT. So if I could solve counterfactuals and selection bias, am I okay, Bobby Joe? Okay. <clears throat> then I'm going to laugh. Now, why did I say SSRI? Well, it's because nine is better than 14, but for the lower value. I didn't know that. Um, so I need to have some way to say, you know, I was trying to find the highest value and why the lowest value. Give me, um, another example. Do people know Comic Book Guy? So imagine one of his weight eight weeks. <laughs> and I got various different diet guys to consider. I can look at the weight that comes after that. And now again, I would say paleo is best. And why is that? Same argument. I want paleo because I that was what happens with paleo. But with the other diets, they're bigger numbers, and I want to find the smallest number. So obvious. But I eh, mean, it's not quite so obvious. Um, <clears throat> what about starvation? Right. Uh, I mean, uh, sure, that's a small number. 
they, maybe I don't really need a school hospital. There's some constraints on that. But then it's for thinking about what the what the actual valuation should be. It's not so obvious. Mm -hmm. All right, keep going at it. Oh yes. What's the next thing about it? Um, that's the center. I'll come back later on. So again, this is a lot more math than I want. So the truth, so to understand the formal model of the learning task is the truth is something that takes a patient, and, it's always math, which takes a patient and an action and return an outcome. That's like the objective label, future the action. And evaluation plus, this is how good is it? Would, some way to evaluate which would I prefer. Which, that's new. That wasn't part of the other three models. And now we're talking about G. That, that's the thing that OL, the A should do. That's taking the R max, the one which gives the largest value and maximizes the score of these, over these different actions. I want to find the G, which is similar. What does similar mean? It means that the G hat, that the, if I look at the best I could possibly do, that's what G was, the R max. I look at G hat, I want the difference of valuation to be small. I don't want that to be as small as possible. I want to minimize that. Now, people who are printing at this and paying attention realize that this doesn't depend on G hat. The way that I'm taking minus nothing, so I, I want to maximize this score. But again, it's just a little, just fun with a, an algebra. So I want to try to maximize. I want to try to find the action hat is the action which I hope of. Maximize the value of the result, the resulting space. So all the RL people are nodding because they've seen it a thousand times. I know, I know. This is sort of the model. Mm -hmm. And notice that this G function actually depends on the valuation function instead of, instead of um, options as well as the truth, but we're going to talk about the valuation function. So. So, <clears throat> back to comic book guy. Got three options. Um, Y sub A is the, is the state that happens is a patient's true weight um, based on just age, second age, but it's died after eight weeks. And so I want to, and the valuation is I want, sorry, 240, I want to make, I want to make this as large as possible, but I want it to lose as much weight as possible. So what's the best action? Well, again, in this case, if I know this information, I want to get the largest value. And any, any guesses here? People didn't read the slide a moment ago. You can find largest numbers. Uh, the paleo is right. Okay. So good. You solved it. I just have a question of where I get the other value. No, I'm just worried about the actions. Aren't there an infinite number of things that you could have made this guy do? Um, well, that's one input. The input is paleo, paleo, big, or no guy. I change it. I mean, if you have just seven other actions, but also, we'll talk about larger sets in a moment. Other questions? <laughs> Comic book guy. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, okay. uh, that, that's this. So, um, now, the problem, of course, is a, uh, which is um, why would you prefer? So, now imagine, imagine how I predicted, which wasn't quite perfect. This is the truth, but this is the prediction we got. You know, I think that the K will be 252 and 220 with Begin and so forth. And now that's what, that's the valuation that would, that would come from that. Um, so now if I use that valuation, I'll choose what I, what I think is the best. So which one has the largest value? Um, Begin? Yeah. Okay, because that's based on an inaccurate decision. How good is that? How much did I lose from the best? Well, the best is actually based on this, because that's what it really is. So um, the true value of using using Degen is based on the true function here. Our, our decision was based on the wrong function. And so the true value is five, and notice that's 10 worse than you would have done had each page. Make sense? <laughs> um, Okay, so he thinks he's done away then I can all that. Yes. Um, I think this is just what I just said a moment ago. Uh, I want I want I want a function which the true quality. Sorry, so this is just repeating what I said earlier. 
So let me go on. Um, so that was a simple example. So two examples of what I mean by best action. Now, it sounds good, but there are some problems. First, one issue is not trying to fix. So um, this, is, this is what happens if he uses the treatment SSRI, and this is a score of suicidal thoughts, a self-assessment in six weeks, or whatever it is. <laughs> but notice, oh, if you don't know that, for, for psychiatric disorders, there are many different measurements. There's suicidality, there's pleasure-seeking, there's anhedonia, and also some medications have a side effect, like weight gain. <clears throat> So this, so this could be the answer. This is the label I get from objective act. Remember I said it goes to some domain, why? But it doesn't have to be a real number. It could be a triple numbers or, or a dozen numbers or it could be whatever. It could be. Uh, so that's the three answers for SSRI. So here it's a matter of three values. In general, <clears throat> treatment is going to involve drug efficacy, side effects, cost, the time it takes, and so forth. So, so now if I look at other groups, Again, imagine I solved selection bias, solved counterfactuals. I can now look at the, the outcome. Use ketamine, SSRIs, or CBT, DC Which of these is best? That's why we have the evaluation function. So we can now talk about the, how to evaluate that. So I need to compare, I need to compute the values to compare this. So John, you asked John, he said, what do you want? Is it I hate suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that's three times worse than, than the uh, pleasure seeking. And I don't care about waking. So that's his function. Let's go look at you know, three times this plus that and just ignore this over there. Okay, that, that, that's, that's what he thinks is important. So he would say SSRI, that's, that's what I prefer. Based on my, based on John's valuation function, that's the preferred treatment. Mm -hmm. John's mother said, ah, they're all three bad. Just add them up. And so what would John's mother think is the best action? Which one of these has the largest value? Ketamine. So notice the issue is not the true value. These are, imagine I solved all the problems. I have the correct model of the world. So the issue is not getting this wrong. It's just whose valuation function I'm using. That makes a difference. And so it does here, it does in general. <clears throat> That's critical. What treatment should I prefer? It depends on what your preferences are. You know, one, uh, an easy mach an easy ish machine learning question is what's the state of the world that happens if I do this? But the other question is how good is that state? And despite what many people say, that's not a machine learning question. That's whoever gave you the problem has to specify this is what I mean to be good. Um, I have lots of discussion with my medical clerk says, Russ, you tell me what I want. No, no, I'm not, I don't see the patient, I don't administer them. You tell me the evaluation function. That's on you. <laughs> Again, life and death decision, dollars, quality adjusted life years, all sorts of measurements. It's got to be objectively computed. Remember, I'm talking about objective measurements. It should be real. So if, it, if it's nominal, Canada versus US, I have to The vector, I can't compare vectors. It's got to be a number which is total order, like real value. It's not learned. It can vary from hospital to hospital, from administration to administration, from patient to patient, but that's part of the input of the problem. Okay. All right. Um, okay. I'm not because it's important. So the final issue in this first pass is objectivity. So, so far, I've been saying everything's objective. I'm, I'm laughing. I can find the best answer. Um, the best answer for weight for color guidance paleo because that's the best value. And I can objectively evaluate, I can objectively evaluate. I give them paleo, I wait, let's say 30 days, and sure enough, there's weights to be done. And that, and that gives me an answer. Uh, I'm assuming these are objective. What is that? What is that? Maximization. And the maximization. But to verify that best. I need to show not just that this score is 225 and hence value is 15. I need to show the other scores are worse. <clears throat> How do I do that? Well, I don't get to see them, right? The Mr. Common book guy actually got this treatment, not the other ones. Oh, <clears throat> <clears throat> so 
So there he is, which one's best? I know it's 225, we know that, we know there's other ones. Um, maybe, oh, maybe I'll comment with this guy, then try begging and see what happens, and then try, and then try no diet, that's gonna solve our problem, right? Uh, maybe, but really, this was in 2020, 2022, he's a different person. He broke up his girlfriend in, in additional weight, and he just got accepted to Harvard, you know, whatever else is happening, he's a different person, <laughs> or, or not. <laughs> So it, and also, also he's a different person because he already had the pain of diet. Maybe his guts can change because of it. And you try time machine, but actually I lied. We don't have one, right? So that's not gonna work. <laughs> so that's why it's not really objective. That's why I use this, this tilde here. Sorry about that. I don't really like that either. So let me talk about um, questions so far. <clears throat> if not, let's talk about four issues that come up. How do objectively verify? So I already said you can't objectively verify for a single person, but but maybe there's a distributional way where the AT or C D. I'll talk about that one. Sampling bias was asked. Uh, what, what does that mean? RCTs are asked just that. Uh, that information, how do you get how does one doctor get from another doctor? You can read it. I'll talk about that. <clears throat> Policies for uh, reinforcement learning trends. Uh, how do you evaluate it? I'll talk about it. So again, I gave you the answers. Now let me describe what really is going on. Ready? Just to verify. So there's comic book guy, CPG. Just, um, and there he is. He's got age and sex and IQ and smoking and so forth. And the diet, and the baby diet, that's his weight, and so that's the diet. But now, that's only one value. Now imagine I had many comic book guys. And now, same person, like I try different diets. And imagine I'm just comparing, just comparing vegan with paleo. And there's my <laughs> randomization, random, random control trials for RCT stands for. And now I can see what the weights are and look at the average value. This average is five for these individuals, for these duplicates, you know, like seven. So that was the highest value. So that's what I'm going to prefer. So again, I'm just to hear that given these inputs, I would say that paleo is the best answer. That's our next or the sample. <laughs> so again, a uh, lot more, lot more simple here. But imagine some distribution of individuals. I can sample, sample the distribution of the answers. Uh, I want to find the ones to maximize. This is lots of math. Let me go to that future. Let me go to future. <laughs> there so let's talk about guy. Now imagine I had the complete population. It's the same thing. I can have different individuals. Ask the, the random, random, random assign them. That's what our randomized control trials are doing. Assign them. Um, try these different models. And I can see the scores and look at the best value. And now I can see for these individuals, the same idea. I can find what the expected value over the subpopulation randomly assigned. Still loud enough? <clears throat> Um, and now, turns out for these individuals, uh, vegan was better. So again, same idea for these individuals. So, so this is the idea of a randomized control trial. So you randomly assign patients to different trials, and now I'm trying to find the action which is best amongst these options within this population. So it's not for individual. It's not an individual treatment effect. It's the average treatment effect. So, yeah. You're assigning. Um, one diet to one set of patients, and the set of patients also differ. Yeah, but I'm, I'm randomizing. I'm saying for this population. So again, I'm, um, uh, let me come back to later on. Why? <laughs> so here I consider many different actors who act in space. I'm not 10, I should stand here every year. So I'm blocking you. So, uh, and, so, so I can consider the um, the two different options, I consider the different individuals, take samples of size R from each one of them. Um, I then compute, I define evaluation of, of this function over sample S as being the average value. I think that's five and three. I let G hat over R samples be the R max in the action which maximizes the scores. And every actual tip, and every individual action assignment. So here again, I would say 
mistaken because that had the highest score. And did my argue I shouldn't be doing it, but everybody said, yeah, I've been weird to be on the side of yeah. And a little bit of math, just pointing out that everything, just look at the, look at the idea that as this number of samples gets larger and larger, the expected value will converge to the correct value of very simple assumption. And so the R max will be the correct value again. So again, if, if, if F is evaluated and it's subjective, then this can be an objective measure as well. <clears throat> issues of statistics and uh, randomization all notwithstanding, at least we have the starting on direction. So this is like, so if I'm defining for a common foot value, that's an individual treatment effect. Now I'm looking at something more like an average treatment effect for a population. At least that's objective. And that's what RCTs are trying to do. I'm going to come back to this point about the sample size but later on. Um, so sampling bias. This is what was asked a moment ago. So if you think about the first three different models, the objective, objective value labels now, objective action, objective of um, action, of the, um, future effects of action, all those just involved um, sampling from the distribution of, over X. That was easy. The objective value, objective labels, future with action, that depended on, on both you know, I'm sampling from the individuals and the actions. And again, I just observe the sample from that distribution and that'll be fine. But this guy requires sampling, requires estimating f of x and a for every x in the population, and also for every action, two actions or kind of random number of actions. <clears throat> so the population, the sample, the data I have only has a single action. So this is a selection bias. You know, I only get to see one of the actions, not all the actions. How does that going to cause problems? <clears throat> so it has from the distribution. So at this point I made over here that it's got to come from the correct distribution. Now imagine it wasn't done randomly. Imagine, for example, I selected the told the younger patients um, the yellow the green circles and older patients the blue, the blue crosses. And now if I say, what treatment, what treatment is best? Remember, I want half and half smiling face. I want the higher one. So which action is best, green or green or red? It's pretty obvious I want green. It's higher value. It's clearly better. <clears throat> um, look at the average values, and we're done. But of course, there was a bias in the sampling. That was what I mentioned a moment ago. Now, imagine, imagine I actually... So this distribution is different from the distribution associated with the whole population. If we look at the entire population, now imagine I could do this experiment, I would see that it looks like this. Now which one is better? <clears throat> well, it's pretty obvious now that, that red's universally better. This is a the sampling bias issue. That I sampled from the long distribution and I got a skewed sample and therefore I got missing information. <laughs> But, um, I should speed up so I'm trying to run out of time. Um, so that's that's why we have our randomized control trials. So I don't I don't skew the sampling. Multi-step actions, um, information gathering, and so forth. So again, the truth is defined this way. So right now I'm saying every person take that. I want um, I want to say, for example, like a negative variance. I want every patient to get the I want the average quality over all the options to be as high as possible. So we'll get R back to that. But now, what about different situations? What if, for example, what, what, can I consider the possibility that paleo is better for men, but vegan is better for women? I consider that possibility. And so it'll be like, I ask about sex, and I make decisions based on male or female. <laughs> so that can say the thing I had earlier. I've got a bunch of, bunch of, a bunch of actions. If every action, I can see the options. So the action is give everyone paleo, everyone vegan, or run this procedure. Of the split first, based on, on sex. And now I can get the same goal. I just look at the average score of this. And once again, I take R max. So again, you look at this, and here you would say actually the best action is in fact this, this policy, non-trivial policy. <laughs> so that's one example, a trivial example of many steps. But if you imagine a um, 
<laughs> with their pathology reports or imaging scans or genetic testing. Now, a doctor has made the decision, but he needs information to make that. And it might not be asking to infect the person, it might be a much more elaborate also time and energy. To rule in a rule in diagnosis or treatment. Um, so it's like a policy. <laughs> I'm running out of time I looked faster. Um, you got many steps. Uh, again, realize that uh, I talked about having having the the objective label FA or future of action having major values. So you can use that here in the decisions. So how do you, so you imagine a diagnostic test where I first do a diagnosis and then depending on the outcome, if the diagnosis says the patient is healthy, um, then I stop. If the diagnosis says the person needs to be treated, I then do a treatment. So there's three options, you know, the diagnosis, and outcome, so, um, and here I'm assuming the treatment's 100% accurate, you know, give the treatment, the patient's healthy. So I can talk about the outcome of the process as being either the diagnosis was a negative and the patient was still fine, the diagnosis was negative and the patient that was sick, or the diagnosis that was positive and the patient was fine at, at the end. Okay, <clears throat> so remember, this is a vector. <laughs> So you can imagine this idea for sequential treatments. Try A if it works, done. Then try B. And that's what lots of doctors do. Psychiatric about yeah. the treatments, you get SSRIs and you piece the dosage in work and try other things like ketamine. <clears throat> um, sequential policies, I mentioned that. Or maybe you do a screening test for a, a mammography first. And then if, that, if that's positive, you then do a more invasive uh, biopsy and so forth, your treatment if necessary. And the whole area of Diagnostics is trying to find these <clears throat> information gathering. I might have to pay money to, to find information, and maybe they're I have to get information and then find the treatment decisions and so forth and try things out. <clears throat> so again, what about a doctor who uses? I need to you know, I find do a geneticist find a gene test, and then depending on a score, I then do a pathology test and have to go to pathologist, or maybe an MRI scan. And then do treatment out. Radiologists in the room? Pathologists? <laughs> so again, I'm going fast, but it's intermediate, but I can still talk about a policy. So the idea is that what's the best action? It could be a complicated thing. The action is, is a policy. <laughs> um, which is best? Um, have to do that. I think I'm going to have to skip a little bit. So um, it will depend on the cost. So let me do this thing and then I'll wrap up. So how do you evaluate an actual? So how do I evaluate an actual sequential policy? The answer is pretty obvious. Take the simple example I gave earlier. Do a diagnosis and then stop and take your lumps if you're wrong. I'll do treatment and, and you solve the problem. What's the cost? What's the expected cost of this policy? Well, it depends on the cost of components. For example, in this world, imagine. If you're sick at the end, it costs you two thousand dollars because who likes being sick? And it's zero if you're not sick. And this diagnosis costs one hundred dollars, and the treatment costs five hundred dollars. Imagine that's the game. I need to, and this is given. This is exogenous. The, the learning algorithm takes as input. Okay. And there's probabilities, <clears throat> which are what's the chance? What's the chance of being sick initially? I'm sorry. Come on. Don't look at this. So there's other, other statistics here, which I have to gather. Did you do that? <laughs> so what's the cost of this policy? Again, I'm going to go fast because it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the expected cost is going to be the cost of, so I'm going to first consider the cost of this trajectory of, of having a negative test, and the patient actually wasn't sick, it's just too negative. So the cost of that is going to be, uh, it's going to be, um, Cost of being sick, so 0.4 times 0.4 times the cost of chance of, of staying sick after you know, of the person who's detected to be sick actually was sick, uh, was healthy, sorry, negative is healthy. So it's 0.4 times 0.9, and it costs hundred dollars. And this other trajectory it goes fast, slides will be available. That's that's twenty one hundred dollars, and the cost this other one is six hundred dollars. So what's the expected cost? It's going to be the chance of 
This beam screw is 0.36 times 100, 0.03 times 100, 0.61 times 600, which you all know would be 465 dollars. Not math that is. So, so is this a good a good policy? So this one's 465 dollars. What about the other simple, simple, simple policy? Everyone gets a treatment. Everyone gets it. What's the cost of that policy? Five hundred dollars, everybody. <laughs> so, which would you rather? The four sixty-five on average, or five hundred? So, is it effective treatment? Okay, I'm going fast. Reinforcement learning, people. I know you're getting bored. You've seen it before. That's the whole idea. Um, reward is the expected value over the whole thing. I want to try to find the best policy. <laughs> um, and now let me. Why is it not advancing? Okay, I think I want to. So just point out, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump to the end because I'm out of time. I'm going to try to jump to the end if I can figure it out. So if I go. <clears throat> oh, Chris, okay. So the other effect is it depends on all of your factors, the cost and the probabilities. Some of the diagnostic tools, and some are based on the environment, things like. Are given exogenously or learned exogenously. Um, jump here, but good. Okay, just pointing out that it makes a difference which one you use. So you can imagine different diagnostics, which you can evaluate. Um, there's some quick comments. Then you give an environment, you expect the cost it depends on all these certain factors. Which diagnosis is best depends on the cost of the diagnosis, these factors, but also on the environmental factors. As many as to evaluate it. If you're not using expected cost, you're doing it wrong. Okay. Anyone who thinks AUC is a good idea is wrong. Talk to me on a long discussion. Okay. Jump in. I got all these little hyperlinks that I can't seem to get to. Let me just try to go faster for this. <laughs> Can you imagine two different diagnostic models with some properties? Which one's best? With the $50 for the test and 90% for false positives and 80% for true negatives. This cost, that's best. And the other model, the other diagnostic tool over there would be worse. But if I start changing any of these properties, I get different answers. I get a better answer for the other tool. <clears throat> so summarize, I want to objectively verify by hand that distributional models, the ATE, average treatment effect work, stands and bias is an issue, but are the keys, that's that. Get information on all based step actions, all that. How do we evaluate these extended models for multiple steps? Again, <laughs> now at the very end, um, okay. so <clears throat> why are we doing? I said this is the right answer to all, all my questions. Why do I talk about these other models? Notice the objective label, direct action, depends on the valuation function. If there's a single valuation function, I'm a company, I want to make money. Um, all I care about is saving patients' lives and not dollars and not quality. <laughs> then you would just have one valuation. If I talk about a situation, well, it's many different valuation functions. So rather than learn the best thing for arbitrary value, which one, rather than a different model, each one of these, which is 7,200 different valuation functions, I can just use projected label of future action. Learn that. Of that model, and then once I have that model, I can then take John or his mother or say different ways to evaluate different diagnostic tools. Yes, the show picture ready. I want to learn the FA, and then I can take John or his mother. Um, in this case, I can learn diagnostic tools, and I, I can then talk about um, different ways to evaluate the slide in here, the animations. <laughs> um, what are future future values? Um, I'm fast here with features. Maybe other agents. Um, it'd be nice if they were objective also, but it doesn't have to be. I think the word one man's son, one man's four, da da da. <laughs> you guys, yeah, I'm just skipping this. Um, so let me compare the do what I do versus objective label. Why are people so compelled by do what I do? It's intuitive. It's like apprenticeships and medical residency is apprenticeships. You follow the doctor, you that person. It doesn't require data. 
and it doesn't require the expert to make it good with the valuation functions. These are good things. The disadvantages, it's only as good as the expert provides a label. They're not perfect. I work with many doctors, they're brilliant people, they work hard, but they're not perfect, and they're all not good at <laughs> And I mentioned this as a positive thing. I think it's good to identify the valuation function. I think it tells what you're trying to do. I'm not trying to just, just feels right. Here's what I'm trying to optimize. Explicit about that. <clears throat> this is what models would generalize other populations. It's helpful to say, I'm trying to do this. And someone say, no, I want to do that. <laughs> so what are the themes? My theme these days is the source is my problem. My question is, why do I care? I don't rude. I do well enough. Why do I care? Why would you use it? <laughs> so instead of, does this patient have depression? Where's a tumor? Does this patient have a stroke? I'm saying, let's talk about the treatment. Should this patient get SSRI? That's the answer. What area should be radiated? Don't tell me the tumor is telling me what I should, how I should process it. Should this patient be airlifted to the stroke clinic right now? <clears throat> so the true labels should try to evaluate the state. You know, you try to produce a state. How good is that state? Um, and then skip this. Value. Uh, the valuation function is a medical issue, not a computational issue. The doctors have to decide about this. I'll help them. But, um, that's me, by the way. <laughs> um, the objective. Okay, um, people know this book. Good book. Uh, the goal. Think about actable tasks. This, and if you think that way, it's easy to think about what to do. If the system returns the wrong answer, what are the consequences? What's the cost of a false positive or false negative? If you can tell me that, then you're halfway to actually solving the problem. And you can not use AC, you can use the real objective value. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, I still look So, only, if only verification of prediction is matching a specific answer, and there's no other way to verify it, then it doesn't affect the world. You probably asked the wrong question. If the prediction doesn't inform an action, then why bother? That's why I want to be objective, that's why I want to be action. <clears throat> that's how I can do it a bit better. Okay, final slide. Thank you for all my wonderful collaborators and medical doctors and, and other colleagues as well as my students as well as my colleagues and Amy. Great guys, it's fun. It'll be fun to play with you guys. <coughs> um, that's my uh, question. Well, I point out that I talked about a few things that interest with patient-specific treatments. I'll give my thoughts right after the end of my presentation. So I'll put it in front. And I think I will end here and wish everyone a Lashanah Tovah for anyone who's you know what the Lashanah is. I don't know if that goes.